Good morning, everyone. Bonjour à tous. Dès le début de la crise, notre gouvernement a annoncé un plan pour mobiliser le secteur to mobilize the industrial sector so that we're able to rapidly produce the products that we need here in Canada. Businesses throughout the country are clamoring to help us, and each week we're able to make important progress. I would like to begin today by giving you an update. First of all, we signed a contract with GL Chemtech Oakville, from Oakville to ensure a supply of chemical products that are essential for tracing. We are starting to um, take up certain activities, and some measures have to be uh, stepped up, such as contact tracing and testing. We have to make sure that our healthcare professionals have the required tools to administer a greater number of tests and, uh, and analyze them. To make sure our frontline workers can continue to do their jobs safely. Joseph Ribkoff, a clothing manufacturing based out of Dorval, will be providing us with 1.2 million made in Canada medical gowns with deliveries starting in July. And the Stevens Company, a medical supply distributor in Brampton, will be supplying 15 million shoe covers as well as 5 million disinfectant wipes, all made in Canada. Over the past few months, our government has helped companies retool their manufacturing facilities and massively scale up production to meet the demands of this crisis. I want to thank every entrepreneur and every worker who stepped up to contribute to this fight. As we start to reopen and some people head back to work, the need for personal protective equipment and other essential supplies like hand sanitizer and disinfectant will continue to grow. <clears throat> We're making sure we're ready for that. On Saturday, a ship carrying 160,000 litres of hand sanitizer arrived in Vancouver, and we're expecting seven more ships with hand sanitizer in the coming days. We also have almost a million sh face shields and more than seven million pairs of gloves on their way to the provinces and territories. And to connect businesses looking for PPE with suppliers, today we're launching a PPE Supply Hub website. We also created new innovative procurement streams to allow more businesses to develop solutions and products Canadians need because of this pandemic. We've always known that Canada is home to some of the best innovators in the world, and it's been great to see so many of them use their talent and know-how to help our communities during this crisis. In April, we put out a call asking for creative, made-in-Canada prototypes that will help current and future outbreaks of COVID-19 and similar public health emergencies. And in just two weeks, we received over 550 proposals. We will soon be selecting some prototypes for testing, and innovators will be able to work with the government to scale up production. Après avoir passé plusieurs mois chez nous, la vie commence After having spent many months at home, life is uh, getting back to a new normal. We have to continue to be vigilant and to uh, follow health authorities' guidelines. But some businesses are beginning to open up, and this is great news. Small businesses, retailers, and entrepreneurs play an essential role in our communities, and we've missed them uh, during the lockdown. It's now time to encourage them as much as possible, all the while being careful and wearing a mask if necessary. The economic opening up uh, presents a challenge for many business owners. After having closed their doors for several months, many are having difficulty in hiring their employees once again because they have uh, cash flow issues. Businesses get ready to reopen. More employers are using the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy to rehire their employees. Just take Track and Trail in Edmonton. Track and Trail was well established in the community, selling outdoor clothing, equipment, and footwear for 36 years. When the pandemic hit, they had to close down their stores. After a number of challenging months, they are now ready to welcome customers again. And as part of getting their shops back up and running, they used the wage subsidy to help rehire their employees. Shops, local entrepreneurs, and business owners are the backbone of our economy. They make our towns and cities better places to call home.
and collectively, they are the largest employer in the country. As we start to reopen, some businesses will need support to get back on their feet, and our government will be there to help with programs like the emergency wage subsidy. I also want to remind people that we launched a hotline service to help entrepreneurs and small business owners, including not-for-profit organizations and charities, navigate these uncertain times. People with pressing financial needs can now call 1-866-989-1080 to speak with an accountant or a business advisor. I would like to remind all business owners that we have launched a helpline to help you go through this period of uncertainty. Entrepreneurs and small businesses, including NGOs, can now call 1-866-989-1080 to obtain the help of an accountant or a financial advisor. Our government has been there for Canadians every step of the way, and we will continue to propose measures to support them. On Saturday, we shared draft legislation with the opposition parties, which included additional proposals to help people. This legislation will aim to provide direct support to people with disabilities, support more workers through the wage subsidy, and ensure that Canadians who aren't able to meet certain judicial timelines, such as bankruptcy, aren't unfairly punished. We will also strive to make CERB payments more flexible, while making sure that those who knowingly and wrongfully claim the CERB face consequences. Discussions are ongoing, but I fully expect us to be able to work well with the opposition to deliver this important support to Canadians. The next few weeks will be filled with activity, but as you know, you can depend on our government. Thank you. Thank you. Question period. Operator. Thank you. Merci. For questions, star one. For the question, étoile un. Première question, Michel Lamarche, TVA. À vous. Michel Lamarche, TVA. Good morning, Mr. Trudeau. I'd like to hear you speak to this proposal of the NDP to extend the CERB by four months. Is this a possibility, or can we presume that things will end abruptly for all of those who have obtained the CERB over 16 weeks? I think it's important to understand that at each and every step, we are looking at what are the correct measures to protect people and what we should do to uh, restart the economy. The CERB was implemented to help those who had no income, who had lost their jobs because of COVID-19. This helped over 8 million Canadians. Of course, when the economy will um, start up again, we will no longer need the CERB. But during this transition period, right now, we are slowly reopening. Some businesses, some sectors are able to restart operations. There are about 3 million people who are still without a job and would like to be working. So we know that we will have to look at how we will end CERB, how we will be able to transition people to the wage subsidy, and we are taking measures to relaunch the economy, all the while supporting Canadians. These discussions are underway at the government level, but also with the other parties. Yes, this is an issue that we are closely examining, and we are open to all suggestions. Uh, wage, uh, sorry, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit was brought in to help those millions of Canadians who lost their jobs because of the pandemic uh, and needed support to be able to pay their rent, to pay, their, pay for their groceries, to support their families. And we did that. Obviously, as the economy starts to reopen, there will be more and more people going back to work. Uh, more and more companies will choose to take the wage subsidy, uh, and therefore people will be leaving the CERB to get onto that because people can start working and be connected to a job uh, even while they get income support. Uh, but obviously, with around 3 million people unemployed and looking for work, uh, it is going to be a while before we get enough jobs uh, to consider that things are back to normal. So we're looking very carefully at how we will uh, 
move forward uh, with the package of measures that we've put forward in a way that makes sense to both encourage people uh, to get back to work, encourage companies uh, to get going again, while at the same time supporting and protecting those people who uh, cannot work because of, uh, because of the pandemic. So we're going to continue our discussions both internally and with other parties to get this right for Canadians. Michel. So can we understand that there will be changes with regards to the CERB? So initiatives for return to work over the next few months. I'd like to hear you speak to uh, those who have committed fraud. Why have you changed your mind? Yes, there will be changes to all our programs as this pandemic evolves and the situation changes in Canada. We will adjust our programs in order to respond to the needs of our communities and uh, to the needs of citizens, workers, and their families. As we've been doing since the beginning, we will continue to adjust and to evolve. Now, with regards to the CERB, we took the decision from the beginning to send money to the greatest amount of citizens as possible. If if we made the process too complicated during the application process, if uh, we had to make too many checks before sending out the CERB, we never would have been able to send checks out to millions of Canadians in a very short period of time, and they needed this money urgently. We knew that this would mean that afterwards we would have to implement measures to correct mistakes and also to um, counter fraudulent claims. So if some people made a mistake, if they received uh, both the CERB and the wage... ...would maximize the speed with which it would reach the millions of Canadians that needed it. That's why we didn't put a tremendous amount of complicated checks and background checks and verifications up front because we needed to flow that money quickly to the millions of Canadians who uh, had no more paychecks and didn't know how they were going to pay for their groceries or their rent. And that's what we did. But we always knew from the beginning that uh, there would be mistakes and indeed that there would be a small number of fraudsters who would try to take advantage of it. Now, there may be a number of people who uh, mistakenly took both the CERB and the wage subsidy because they weren't sure what they were going to do and they were really worried and they just took everything. Those people will simply have to pay back uh, the one that they uh, shouldn't have been taken and we're not looking at punishing people who made honest mistakes. Obviously, this is a time for us to pull together as a country. But unfortunately, in every situation, there are a few criminals uh, who will deliberately try to take advantage of a moment of uh, solidarity, a moment where we're in crisis and we're trying to help each other out by deliberately frauding the system. And as I said, defrauding the system. And as I said from the very beginning, uh, we will make sure that we are punishing people who try to take advantage uh, of this situation. Uh, and we've put measures in place that will allow us to go after the deliberate fraudsters who are trying to game the system for, uh, for criminal benefits. Thank you. Operator, next question. Thank you. Merci. Next question, Ryan Timothy, National Post. Line open. Yeah, good morning, sir. I'm, I'm wondering, several of the opposition parties have said that as part of their support, they, they want to see a fiscal update from the government. Uh, you didn't have a budget this year for obvious reasons, but I'm wondering why uh, we're not going to see a fiscal update or if we're going to see a fiscal update before the end of uh, Parliament sitting. We've continued, Ryan, to demonstrate openness and transparency on all the measures we've put forward. Uh, we've answered questions on all of them, both from the opposition, from uh, press conferences like these. We've announced all the measures we're putting forward, and uh, there has been a tremendous amount of transparency. The challenge with fiscal updates is uh, a part of, a core part of that is predicting what things are going to look like 
for the rest of the year and for the coming years. And obviously in this situation, uh, any predictions we make will be wildly unreliable, uh, even from one week to, a next, to the next. Uh, we're uh, you know, grappling to understand what exactly the Canadian economy is doing in this unprecedented situation. We will, however, continue to look at ways of being open and transparent with Canadians about the measures we've put forward, about our expectations uh, for the coming weeks, and uh, that kind of transparency is just what Canadians expect, and we'll be working with Canadians on that. People know that we've been transparent since the beginning with all the measures that we've implemented for Canadians. We answer media questions regularly, questions from the opposition, and we share our investments with the Finance Committee. Canadians are able to see how we're acting and reacting during this pandemic. The challenge the challenge with economic updates is that there is an integ integrated part is that is a, a forecast as to what's going to happen in the months and years to come. We are in a very unstable position, a, a very unstable period of time. We don't know what's going to happen in a month or two, never mind two or three years. We're going to continue to try and find ways to be open and transparent, but people cannot expect that we're going to have a clear idea of uh, the uh, economic uh, position will be in in 2021. Our priority is uh, to help people as much as we can right now. Parliamentary Budget Officer has been able to make projections. You've been able to cost all of your programs to date. I, I know what you're saying about the unpredictability of the Canadian economy, but you know, next week you're going to ask Parliament to approve $87 billion in new spending. Wouldn't it be beneficial to have a best guess of, of where that's going to put the country's um, debt and deficit? Uh, we have been, obviously, in the Parliamentary Budget Officer and at Finance Committee, we've been tallying up uh, the costs and the expenses and the investments that we've been making to support Canadians through this. But establishing or laying out the state of our economy when our economy is, for the large part, frozen or in a coma, like right now, you know, most or so many businesses and uh, economic activity is simply suspended. It's not gone. It's not never coming back. It's not. Uh, it's not. You know, quietly going along slowly. It's just in suspension. And to know what's going to happen when it restarts uh, is extremely uncertain. So we will continue to be open and transparent about all sorts of things in terms of what we're doing and how much we're spending and what our, our path looks like, what our expectations for that spending in the coming uh, weeks looks like. But a fiscal update that talks about you know, what our projected revenues or expenditures could be uh, six months from now or a year from now uh, would be incredibly unreliable because we just don't know what the impact of this pandemic is on uh, the, the, the sum total of the Canadian economy because we are suspended right now. To create forecasts on what our economy might look like once it restarts is uh, impossible because we don't know our businesses our organizations throughout the country are in suspension. Will they open up at half capacity, at 75%, 100% capacity, or will they simply disappear? We don't know. There will be many different situations in the months to come. During this pandemic, we don't know about a second wave and if there will be international impacts that will be felt as well. We will continue to be very open and transparent with regards to the expenses and uh, what we will spend in the months to come. But to set out the state of our economy and what will be the state of our economy in one year, in three years, this would be based on uh, estimates or it would be based on totally random uh, data. Thank you. Question question, Melanie Marquis, La Presse, à vous. 
Uh, Hello, thank you. Mr. Trudeau, if we come back to the bill that will be tabled tomorrow, the NDP leader earlier today said that he feared that this could criminalize further uh, racialized uh, and indigenous communities. What would you say to him to reassure him? I understand this concern, but that is not at all the intention of this bill. With this bill, first of all, we want to help Canadians. Canadians uh, living with disabilities, uh, they will receive extra money. We want to make sure that more businesses will qualify for the wage subsidy. We want to make sure that we will help more people with this bill. But yes, at the same time, we're giving ourselves the um, ability to uh, sanction fraudsters who are trying to deliberately take advantage of the system during a crisis and when people are most vulnerable. We do not have the intention of penalizing people who make a mistake, who made a mistake, but we have to have a system that uh, is able to uh, target people who um, deliberately defrauded the system. We can work with the other parties uh, to assuage their concerns, to uh, make some amendments to the bill so that it will protect the integrity of our system. A follow-up question? Yes. With regards to the CERB, over the past few days, in the past few weeks, you seem to send out the message that this would end soon. And today, you're saying that you're open to an extension of the CERB, or at least a, a, a changes. So what's changed? Since the beginning, we have known that the CERB was created to help people who are not working. As the economy opens up, as people are able to return to work, we will not have a, as great a need. But with the job losses that we've seen, the 3 million Canadians who would like to be at work and who don't have work, we know that it will be needed uh, for a while. The wage subsidy will not be able to help everyone who lost their job. We are therefore trying to see how we're going to make the shift towards an economy that is opening up with, uh, with more businesses that are turning to the wage subsidy. But with many people who are unable to work because of COVID and who need direct support. Merci. Thank you. Prochaine question, Lina Dib, La Presse Canadienne. À vous. Lina Dib, Canadian Press. Hello, Mr. Trudeau. Well, I'm surprised. I, I thought that was all for the French questions. I'd like to come back now on the CERB and the bill that will be tabled on Wednesday. So if I understand correctly, when you say uh, that you're going to target this uh, small minority of criminals, you seem to suppose that this small minority are not racialized people? As Mr. Singh is saying, answer, we have a question that uh, has to be a, a very um, has to be a solid system where people are helping themselves. We don't want those who deliberately choose to defraud the system and to uh, exploit a choice that we've made to send money, first of all, to people and then to make the checks afterwards. I think that people want our system to be fair. Of course, we will look at all the situations. We'll look at these case by case, but we need uh, to have a rigorous system to make sure that we are helping the right people. Okay. And so for this shift from the CERB to the wage subsidy, I understand that uh, this is the intention. This hasn't really worked up until now. Do you have a plan? Do you have an idea as to how you're going to push towards to people towards the wage subsidy? Let me correct this a little bit. Ever since the beginning, we knew that people needed the CERB. People lost their jobs. The economy stopped for two months. 
and people no longer had a link with their workplace. Millions of people no longer received uh, their paycheck, and we needed for these people to stay home. We needed for them not to try to go uh, and seek work in the middle of a uh, lockdown period. So the CERB was there for this period of time when the economy was closed. And we needed the economy to uh, lock down to protect people's health. Of course, now, as economic activity is starting up again, people are going to work. And once, once again, we have to do this carefully. Many people are going to leave the CERB and to be on the wage subsidy or will simply go back to their former jobs. And as the situation evolves, we will have less people needing the CERB. So we will bring forth changes to the system as required. The system is working step by step. It's working correctly. BNN Bloomberg is reporting this morning that finance officials are preparing to deliver a fiscal update sometime this summer. Uh, your government didn't deliver a federal budget this spring, um, and Canadians don't really have a clear picture of where the government finances are. Will you commit to delivering either a budget or a fiscal update before Labor Day? Uh, we have been open and transparent every step of the way about our investments, about uh, the measures we're taking to support Canadians. Uh, we've been presenting regularly at Finance Committee all of our uh, expenditures. We've been debating measures in the House. We've been taking questions from media, from uh, opposition parties every step of the way because transparency during a time of crisis is extremely important. And we will continue uh, to look for ways uh, to share with Canadians what we're doing, how we're helping them, and uh, what, uh, what kind of fiscal frame we find ourselves in. The challenge with any fiscal update is as the economy starts up again, it's very difficult to know what that will look like. We can certainly have a range of projections that will vary widely depending on you know, how uh, many businesses reopen and to what percentage. Are restaurants going to be half full? Are, are they going to rehire? Are they going to shut down and go bankrupt? Uh, are uh, people going to start going out again and shopping? Are they going to, uh, you know, hunker down for the summer in their in their cabins or at home and and not go out. I mean there are so many things that we simply don't know that making projections about what our economy could look like six months from now or a year from now uh, would be an exercise in uh, in invention and imagination. Obviously we need to continue to be transparent and concrete about everything we're doing and uh, forecast what kind of expenditures we're going to have in the coming weeks and months. Uh, but a proper fiscal update uh, is something that, that you know, includes usually projections on three to five years in the future that we simply don't know about. The Parliamentary Budget Officer has produced a uh, deficit projection of $260 billion. I don't think that's, he would consider that invention or imagination. Um, but regardless of what that figure is exactly, future governments are going to have to carry that debt. The servicing costs on that are going to be very high. Sorry? The, the servicing costs on the debt that you're going to have to carry, that you're, you're adding to now, right? Interest rates are at historic lows, Glenn. Uh, okay, but it's still a lot of money. No, 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 no. It's, it's still a lot that, of money. No, no. It, and, and you don't that, know where... The, okay, so, so, so but, but how, how are you going to pay for that? How okay. are you going to pay for those costs in, in future years? Are you going to increase taxes or are you going to uh, cut programs? Okay. Right now, we're in an absolutely unprecedented situation where our economy had to completely shut down. And the government chose to and needed to be there for people while they lost their paychecks, while uh, they could not uh, you know, be comfortable in how they were going to be able to support their families, pay their rent, pay for their groceries. We put forward measures to support Canadians right across the country so that we could stay healthy and so that we could have an economy to come back to as soon as the opportunity arose. We have been absolutely transparent every step of the way about these investments we're making for Canadians, about how we are supporting millions of Canadians, millions of, of people, thousands upon thousands of small businesses across this country get through this unprecedented time. Canada went into this crisis 
with a far better fiscal position than just about any other G7 country. And uh, we are coming through it extremely well as well. The investments we're making that will allow Canada to bounce back strongly from this uh, are the kinds of things that we needed to do during this pandemic. And as we move forward, uh, because of historically low interest rates, the debt servicing costs will be low. But we will need to uh, look very carefully at how we, uh, we uh, remain fiscally responsible as we move forward. But the best thing to focus on is ensuring that Canadians can come back from this strongly, that they can get back to work, that they can reopen their stores and their businesses, that they have confidence once again in our economy and our future. And those are the things that we need to do, needed to do in the short term in order for us to have a long term for our Canadian economy. Nous faisions face à une crise. We were facing an unprecedented crisis. Millions of Canadians were facing a situation where they had no more paycheck. They were not able to pay for their groceries or their rent or to take care of their families. And as a government, we chose to help Canadians to go through this crisis, this, this pandemic, so that we would be able to come back stronger than ever at the end of the crisis. To do that, we needed to invest immediately to support Canadians. The best way of having a healthy economy in the years to come was to make sure that people could hold on during this crisis, and this is the choice that our government made. With interest rates at a historically low level, the fact that the government chose to support Canadians in the way that we did it was the best way to minimize the consequences and also the costs of these measures for the years and the decades to come. Louis Blouin, Radio-Canada. At the end of the 16-week period for the CERB, there are many people who are going to find themselves in a vacuum. They're going to wonder, oh, what's going to happen to me? They won't have access to the wage subsidy and they won't have a job. What can you tell these people who are going through great uncertainty and who don't know what the shift will be for them? Can you explain to these people what measures are being considered? Will it be a more targeted, flexible CERB? Will it be a return to uh, a, a reviewed EI program? Could you give us some indications? Ever since the beginning, we have said that as a government, that we would be there for people, that we would support them. We created the CERB to support the millions of people who lost their jobs. Even if the economy is beginning to start up again, we recognize that not all jobs will be coming back soon. Some people will continue to require assistance Announcements will be made in the years to come, and this will explain how exactly we will help them. But I can reassure people that as a government, we will continue to be there for you. We will support you during this crisis. Now, on this question of fraud, will there be extra staffing uh, to ensure that checks are made, and who will do this? If you're announcing penalties and there's no one to apply, uh, it's a smokescreen. So have you uh, foreseen the hiring of extra staff? Since the beginning, we have implemented, we have made sure that we had sufficient amount of staffing so that the measures would be applied correctly. We will continue to work with our extraordinary public service already. They've done an amazing job throughout the country to uh, deliver these programs. We want to make sure that uh, the integrity of this program is um, retained and that there will be consequences for those who try to commit fraud deliberately. using evidence to guide your policy make, uh, decisions. What evidence do you now have, what analysis have you done to look at wh why people are not transferring from the CERB to the wage subsidy and how to go forward uh, as the economy reopens? 
I think the important thing to understand was the wage, uh, sorry, the, the um, emergency response benefit was there to support people during the time and is there to support people during this time of crisis when they lost their jobs because of COVID-19. They cannot work because of this pandemic through no fault of their own and the government needs to be there to support them so they can continue to support their families, continue to pay rent and buy groceries. The Canada Emergency Response Benefit was created for the time when we were telling everyone, stay home, don't go to work, shut down your businesses, uh, keep your neighbours safe. It was there to replace revenue at a time where massive parts of the economy were completely shut down. And it serves and served its purpose extremely well and will continue to be necessary uh, until uh, we uh, move forward enough to get, to get to most people back to work. As people start getting back to work, as people start thinking about that link between employer and employee in businesses, small and large, right across the country, more and more businesses will start taking on that wage subsidy as a way of preparing and reopening. This is a natural progression of things from that moment of we need people to stay home and not collect paychecks to now we want you thinking about your job and reconnecting as different parts of the company, our uh, country, are reopening in a progressive way, uh, in a gradual way. So the transfer from most people on the Canada Emergency Response Benefit towards more and more people on the wage subsidy as the economy picks up again uh, is uh, exactly what we foresee and exactly how the system should work. Prime Minister Janet Silver, Global News. In mid-May, when we first heard reports um, that there was some fraud with, uh, fraud with CERB, you discounted the abuse, saying that it was probably just a few people among millions of Canadians who are applying for this benefit. But now you're bringing in legislation that will fine or imprison people for fraudulent claims. I'm just wondering what specifically changed in the last three weeks to change your thinking to push for this? Uh, the thinking hasn't changed at all. We always knew that the choice we had to make with the Canada Emergency Response Benefit was minimizing the amount of paperwork and verification up front so that it could flow rapidly to the millions of people who needed it. But we knew at the same time that there would be mistakes made, you know, good faith, honest mistakes that we would need to clean up afterwards and make sure that people paid back if they got both the wage subsidy and the response benefit, for example. And there's no harm, no foul on that if it's an honest mistake. But unfortunately, we also knew that, as with any system, there would be a very small minority, as I pointed out, of people who deliberately try to take advantage of the system. And we needed to make sure, we need to make sure that we have the tools to be able to assure the integrity of the system. People's confidence in their institutions, people con people's confidence in how their tax dollars are spent and invested is really important. And people need to know that uh, criminals who try to take advantage of a system, particularly at a time where we're pulling together as a country, where we're looking out for each other, where we're supporting each other, um, is still important. So uh, we're making sure that, that we do have the tools. Hopefully we will not have to use them very much at all because the vast majority of people are of good faith and just trying to support their families and trying to do the right things to get us all through this. But we do need the tools to go after those who deliberately choose to take advantage of people and systems vulnerability in a time of crisis. Hi, Prime Minister, Tom Perry, CBC. Uh, one of your MPs, Marwan Tabara from Kitchener, is uh, facing charges. He stepped back from your caucus. These charges date back to April. I'd like to know when you or your officials learned about them and what action you're gonna be taking. Um, as, uh, as we said, um, I and uh, my office uh, only learned about uh, the serious charges uh, against this MP uh, on Friday. 
Uh, no one in my party or my organization knew anything about them until Friday. Uh, and when we found out about these serious charges, um, the correct steps were taken for uh, uh, Mr. Tabara to remove himself from the Liberal Party of Canada caucus. Um, that is, uh, that is the measure that we have in place, um, and that is what we're doing. Okay. Uh, nous n'avions appris uh, de ces allégations. We learned of these serious allegations on Friday. As a party, um, neither I nor my office was aware of this before Friday. These are very serious allegations, and so Mr. Tavera had to withdraw from the Liberal Party caucus. While a justice uh, is underway. In your conversation uh, with the with the commissioner, was it you saying to the commissioner, "This is something I want the RCMP to do"? Was it the commissioner saying to you, "This is something we should do"? Where did the idea come from? Uh, it was uh, a conversation in which uh, it was raised as one of the things that people had been talking about, and the commissioner pointed out that there had been studies and there had been pilot projects. Uh, there were concerns around the technology. There were concerns around uh, the logistics involved, uh, particularly in some of our more remote areas. Uh, and there were, of course, uh, concerns around uh, the financial cost of this. Uh, but uh, in that discussion, it became clear that those were sort of practical challenges that could be resolved and uh, that it was uh, probably an idea that's, uh, that's time has come to, uh, for greater transparency. But of course it is uh, only one measure amongst many, many things that we need to do to address uh, systemic challenges in this country to racialized and indigenous Canadians. Um, there are uh, so many different things that we need to look at as a country to uh, take concrete action on, and that is something that we're engaged with, uh, not just uh, our justice system, uh, but uh, with uh, Canadians, uh, with organizations, with uh, different advocacy groups, uh, to look at how we can take this moment uh, to bring real action forward uh, to transform this country for the better. But who raised it, sir? Was it you or the commissioner? Um, I don't recall. It was a conversation in which it, it, came, it came together, it came up. Merci beaucoup. C'est ce qui m'a fait la conférence de presse aujourd'hui. Merci tout le monde. Bonjour et merci Good de vous morning. être joints à nous aujourd'hui. Today. today we will hear from Canada's Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Theresa Tam, the Deputy Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Howard New, the Minister of Public Services and Procurement, Anita Anand, by video link, the Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry, Navdeep Baines, the Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness, Bill Blair, et le Président du Conseil du Trésor, Jean-Yves Duclos. Uh, and Mr. after Board that, President, we'll be happy to answer your questions. Dr. Tam, please. Good afternoon and bonjour. At the end of the day, Monday, June the 8th, there are now 96,244 confirmed cases, including 7,835 deaths and 54,833 cases, or 57 percent of cases have now recovered. Labs across Canada have tested over 1,930,000 people for COVID-19 to date, with about 5% of these testing positive overall. Over the past week, we have been testing an average of 33,000 people daily. These numbers change quickly and are now being updated once daily in the evenings on canada.ca slash coronavirus. As we increase social and economic activities and lift some public health measures, 
we are doubling down on other public health measures to keep the epidemic under control. Testing and isolating cases, as well as tracing and quarantining the contacts as quickly as possible, is a key part of our control strategy as we move forward to stop new chains of transmission from spreading. Laboratories across the country have been working hard to increase testing capacity, building up equipment, supplies and people. Across the country, capacity is in place to test more than 60,000 people daily, and laboratories will continue to build on this to prepare for any possible surges in COVID-19. So how do we know we are testing enough? One way is to monitor the percentage of all laboratory tests conducted over the course of the week that comes back positive. We aim for low percentage positive, below 10%, which is the international benchmark. This tells us that we are casting the net wide to test a lot of people around each positive case, while narrowing in on areas where the virus is spreading. Canada has maintained the percentage positive COVID-19 lab tests below 10 throughout the pandemic, and with a steady increase in testing, this percentage has been continuing to decline. Over the last week, as I said, an average of 33,000 people have been tested daily across Canada, with 2% of these testing positive. These numbers are important for public health and governments at all levels to monitor carefully each week as we monitor the sensitivity of our surveillance and to make adjustments to laboratory testing and epidemic control strategies as needed. Canadians can also play an important role in laboratory testing to detect cases early and stop transmission. We can support friends, neighbours and colleagues who go for testing, especially those who test positive. We won't always know where the virus will turn up, and we are all in this together. Thank you. Merci. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Tam. I met Mange Don La Parole and Dr. Howard New. Merci. Go ahead. Bonjour. À la fin de la journée de lundi 8 As juin, on dénombrait 96 244 cas confirmés, donc 7 835 décès et 54 833 personnes rétablies, ce qui représente à 57 des cas. Les laboratoires de partout au Canada ont analysé à ce jour plus de 1 930 000 tests de dépistage pour la COVID-19 et environ 5 d'entre eux se sont avérés positifs. Au cours de la dernière semaine, nous avons testé en moyenne 33 000 personnes par jour. Ces chiffres changent rapidement et se sont mis à jour une fois par jour en soirée à l'adresse canada.ca baroblique coronavirus. À mesure que nous permettons la reprise des activités sociales et économiques et levons certaines mesures de santé publique, nous redoublons d'autres mesures sanitaires afin de maîtriser l'épidémie. La détection et l'isolement des cas ainsi que la recherche et la mise en quarantaine de leurs contacts le plus rapidement possible constituent des éléments essentiels de la stratégie de lutte que nous privilégions pour briser les nouvelles chaînes de transmission. Les laboratoires du pays mettent tout en œuvre pour accroître les capacités de dépistage en augmentant la, la quantité d'équipements et de fournitures ainsi que le nombre d'employés. À l'échelle nationale, nous disposons des capacités pour lutter pour tester plus de 60 000 personnes par jour. Les laboratoires continueront de renforcer ces capacités afin de se préparer à toute recrudescence de l'épidémie de COVID-19. Alors, comment pouvons-nous savoir si nous effectuons suffisamment des tests. Une façon consiste à surveiller le pourcentage des tests effectués par les laboratoires au cours de la semaine qui s'avèrent positifs. Nous visons un taux de positivité inférieur à 10 soit le point de référence international. Cela nous indique que nous ratissons largement en testant beaucoup de personnes associées à chaque cas positif, tout en nous concentrant sur les zones de propagation du virus. Le Canada a maintenu le pourcentage de résultats Positif, les laboratoires ont des sacs de 10 tout au long de la pandémie et, malgré une augmentation graduelle de dépistage, ce pourcentage a continué à baisser. Au cours de la dernière semaine, 33 000 personnes en moyenne ont été testées chaque jour au Canada 
et 2 d'entre elles ont obtenu des résultats positifs. Il est important pour les responsables de la santé publique et tous les ordres de gouvernement d'examiner attentivement ces chiffres chaque semaine afin de surveiller les sensibilités de notre surveillance et d'apporter les changements nécessaires au dépistage en laboratoire et aux stratégies de lutte contre l'épidémie. Les Canadiens peuvent également Canadians jouer un rôle important dans le dépistage en laboratoire afin que les cas soient détectés rapidement et que les maladies ne se transmettent pas. Nous pouvons appuyer nos amis, nos voisins et nos collègues qui subissent une test, surtout ceux qui testing, obtiennent un résultat positif. Nous ne pouvons pas toujours savoir où il y aura des cas et nous devons nous montrer solidaires. Merci. Okay. Merci beaucoup, Dr. Mill. Thank you uh, now we will hear you. from our Minister of Public Services and Procurement, Anita Nand. Anita, please. Thank you, Christia. Good afternoon. I will start today by acknowledging and thanking my provincial and territorial counterparts in procurement for their dedication and collaboration throughout this pandemic. We have spoken regularly since the beginning of this crisis to ensure that our approach to this historic procurement endeavour is coordinated and effective across the country. Au moment où les restrictions sont graduellement levées, il est encore lifted. plus important de fournir aux travailleurs de la santé line, de première ligne l'équipement dont ils ont besoin. Et need. nous devons travailler ensemble pour que ce soit so le cas. Now for an update on deliveries. In keeping with our approach to diversify supply chains, flights of PPE and other supplies are coming in every day now. And Canadian companies have ramped up and retooled to help Canada in the fight against COVID-19. This past week, we received eight plane loads of supplies, bringing us to a total of 58 cargo flights from China carrying a wide variety of PPE. And we are now transporting supplies by sea as well. The first ship arrived in the port of Vancouver last Saturday, carrying 160,000 liters of hand sanitizer. A second ship carrying 32 shipping containers of hand sanitizer is scheduled to arrive in Vancouver today, and six more ships are on the way. We also continue to receive supplies from the United States, such as N95 respirators from 3M, at a rate of approximately half a million per month. In terms of mobilizing industry, we have signed 26 domestic contracts, and I want to thank Minister Navdeep Baines and his team for their work on this front to mobilize Canadian industry. Overall, we are meeting the need when it comes to the procurement of PPE at the federal level as we supplement the procurement efforts of the provinces and territories themselves. And Canadian companies are now leading in our pandemic response on several fronts while sustaining and creating jobs across the country. Their contribution is proving to be essential in fighting COVID-19. Par exemple, à ce jour, For nous example, avons reçu 13,8 millions d'écrans spéciaux, dont presque la moitié a Half été fabriqué ici, chez nous. Here. Nous avons maintenant reçu plus de 6,6 millions de litres de désinfectant pour les mains, provenant surtout de fabricants canadiens. De plus, nous avons reçu Moreover, plus de 100 millions de masques, ainsi que 34 millions de paires de gants et presque 4 millions well de blouses. Million In addition, approximately 160 ventilators have been delivered and are being inventoried by the Public Health Agency of Canada. Finally, we have distributed more than 2.7 million N95 respirators to the provinces and territories. Moving now to new contracts, we continue to sign new contracts focusing on domestic manufacturers tapping into the ingenuity and the tenacity of Canadian companies to see us through the pandemic in the short and the long term. 
I am happy to announce that we have signed a contract with Joseph Ribkoff, a manufacturer based out of Dorval, Quebec. They will provide us with 1.2 million Made in Canada gowns with deliveries starting in July. We have also signed a contract with the Stevens Company, a distributor based in Brampton, Ontario. They will be supplying us with 15 million shoe covers as well as 5 million disinfectant wipes, all of which will be made right here in Canada. These domestic contracts are important as we continue to build multiple diversified supply chains for Canada's benefit now and into the future. Now for an announcement. We know that as we move forward, access to PPE will be essential to Canada's recovery. Restrictions are easing across this country in one form or another, and business owners, organizations, and all Canadians want to know how they can find the right PPE for their own circumstances. I am pleased to announce that we are taking action to meet that need to find information about PPE. Today, we are launching the Government of Canada's PPE Supply Hub to bring together available resources and information for organizations that are buying and selling personal protective equipment. Ce nouvel outil en ligne donne, entre autres, de l'information fiable et basée sur les directives du Centre canadien d'hygiène et de sécurité au travail à propos du type d'équipement de protection individuelle nécessaire pour assurer la sécurité des employés et des clients. Il aide également au jumelage de vendeurs et d'acheteurs d'équipements de protection à l'intérieur du marché canadien. We have assembled a broad collection of important resources, including web platforms launched by provinces and territories themselves, and those stemming from the private sector also, such as the rapid response platform that has to date successfully matched PPE buyers and sellers more than 34,000 times. The supply hub also includes consumer information for any Canadian who wants to buy PPE to help to inform their buying decisions. This new tool is available to all Canadians and I invite you to visit the PPE supply hub at Canada .ca slash coronavirus. Over time, we will continue to expand and enhance the Supply Hub with new content. I would like to thank the Supply Council and my provincial and territorial counterparts for their important input into the Supply Hub over the past weeks. We will also continue to work with provinces and territories and industry to ascertain additional means of support and ways that we can help Canada's PPE needs. This announcement is an important step in assisting Canadians with their PPE needs as our economy reopens. As demand for PPE goes up, Canada is keeping up. In closing, nous avons un message pour nos travailleurs de soins de la santé, ainsi que pour as well tous as les Canadiens et les Canadiennes. Alors que nous entrons une nouvelle étape new dans la réponse du Canada à la pandémie, je vous assure Canada, que votre sécurité demeure notre priorité absolue. Absolute priority. Cette situation nous This concerne tous et nous sommes là pour vous. For you. We are here for you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, Anita. And now we will hear from our Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry, Navdeep Baines. Nav, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Christia. As Canadians continue to deal with this unprecedented crisis, they can take comfort in knowing that thousands and thousands of Canadian companies are stepping up to help. Innovators from across the country have proven that Canadian know-how and thinking outside the box can lead to exciting and promising discoveries. We've seen this play out many times during the past few weeks. From using construction house wrap as a Health Canada certified alternative material for medical grade gowns, to bringing together a coalition of Canadian manufacturers to design and produce multiple made in Canada ventilators, to sourcing and studying potentially groundbreaking point of care test kits through our innovative solutions challenge. 
les innovateurs, les chercheurs et les fabricants canadiens sont prêts à relever les défis lancés. Et nous avons récemment mis un autre appel sous le Innovative Solutions Canada Initiative, cette fois par le prototype testing stream pour les solutions médicales et non médicales. Nous avons demandé pour les créatives made in Canada technologies pour adresser la COVID-19 pandémie and similar public health emergencies. And the response has been absolutely amazing. In just two weeks, we received 562 proposals from innovators across the country. Tous les ministères et organismes gouvernementaux ont accès aux prototypes novateurs proposés et peuvent les mettre à l'essai pour combattre la COVID-19 et d'autres défis similaires. The innovations selected for testing will be eligible for contract awards to support the efforts to bring these innovative prototypes to market. As you know, we've been working with Canadian companies to retool and scale up production of necessary material components for COVID-19 testing. As we said before, it will be critical moving forward that we secure domestic capacity for components needed for widespread testing. That's why. I'm pleased to announce that we progressed from a letter of intent to a signed contract with Ontario-based GL Chemtech to produce and supply a chemical that is absolutely necessary to perform COVID-19 testing. Guanadine uh, thiocyanate is neither easy to pronounce nor easy to produce. Nous devons viser l'autosuffisance et être en mesure de We nous procurer ici ce composé chimique en forte demande. And adding to over a dozen apparel demand. manufacturers we have worked with who are now producing medical gowns, we now also have a contract in place as mentioned by Minister Anand with a woman's apparel designer, Joseph Ribkoff. They will manufacture medical grade gowns from their headquarters in Montreal. Canadian companies have also significantly stepped up to produce face shields. In addition to over a dozen companies retooling to produce more than 40 million face shields, including companies like Bauer and Burloke, we again are turning to Canadian companies to meet this need. So I'm pleased to share with you that we have posted a request for proposal seeking made in Canada shields, face shields, and this is a positive development. It means that we have created enough made in Canada capacity to meet our needs for face shields from Canadian companies. We often talk about finding opportunities in a crisis and we're seeing so many willing partners coming together to help their fellow Canadians during this uncertain period. Together, as we continue to move forward to develop made in Canada solutions, I know we will come out of this together and stronger. I look forward to updating you again on more good news in the near future. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Naf. And now we will hear from our Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness, Bill Blair. Bill, please. Thank you very much, Deputy. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, no segment of Canadian society has been untouched by COVID-19, and that includes the inmates and correction workers who are, are daily in our federal correction system. Staff in the correction facilities and federal inmate populations have faced an increased risk and unique challenges in the fight against COVID-19 because of the closed environment of our institutions. Correction Services Canada has worked very closely alongside the Public Health Agency of Canada and local public health authorities to best protect the health and the safety of staff, inmates, and the public. And over the course of this pandemic, COVID-19 has spread throughout some of our institutions, and we have responded. In all of the infected institutions, staff, in partnership with public health and local health authorities, have conducted workplace health and safety audits, infection control and prevention audits. They've ensured that all inmates and all staff have access to appropriate uh, personal protection equipment. They've retooled their work programs within the prison system to become self-sufficient in the development and production of personal protection equipment. There have been medical services and supports provided to those who required it, testing and 
and tracing has been effective and comprehensive in all of these in institutions. And as a result of all this extraordinary work between our correction staff, the Public Health Agency of Canada, and local public health authorities, that as of today, there is one active case of COVID-19 in our federal correction systems. Over the past three months, there have been 360 confirmed cases. All except two have recovered. And I think it's important and I want to acknowledge that two inmates did pass as a result of complications from COVID-19. And, and, and these deaths are deeply troubling and they motivate us and inspire us to continue to work hard to protect all of the people living and working within these federal institutions. As a system focused on rehabilitation and effective reintegration, it is important to remember that our correction system often extends well beyond the walls of our federal institutions. Community-based residential facilities, more commonly known as halfway houses, are a critical component to this process. National voluntary organizations support the operation of many halfway houses across Canada. They work with offenders when they're ready to transition into a supervised community living environment to make sure that they have the support that they need to be successful based on each person's individual and unique needs. The work of the National Voluntary Organization is an extremely important component of our correction system. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, they have seen significant and increased demand for their services. We have been fortunate. They have adapted quickly. They've built new partnerships and changed the way that they normally operate to find creative solutions to respond to the crisis. They require and deserve our support for this important work. And that is why today I am very pleased to announce that the Government of Canada will provide up to $500,000 to five national voluntary organizations. These include the Association de Rehabilitation Sociale de Quebec, the Canadian Association of Elizabeth Fry Societies, the John Howard Society of Canada, the National Associations Active in Criminal Justice, and the St. Leonard Society of Canada. This funding will support the development of pilot projects to help these organizations to adapt to adapt while they reintegrate offenders under their supervision. It will also help to explore and assess practices that they've already implemented to reduce the spread of COVID-19 so that our institutions can implement more robust infection preventive pr pr protocols going forward. Half to, halfway houses will also now be able to submit COVID-related expenses to Correction Services Canada for reimbursement, allowing them to focus on maintaining healthy environments for their residents. The Government of Canada is proud to be a partner with these national voluntary organizations. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank them for their, all they do to provide safe, secure and supportive environment for offenders serving time in the community. Their important work creates better outcomes for offenders and it helps keep Canadians safe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. And now I give the parole to the President of the Conseil de Trésor, Jean-Yves Duclos. Jean-Yves, please. Merci, Christia. Good afternoon, everyone. Bonjour, tout le monde. Aujourd'hui, un certain nombre de nouvelles importantes de la part du Premier ministre et de nos collègues, Christia. Premièrement, ce que M. Blair vient de résumer, c'est-à-dire des investissements pour protéger les agents et les personnes qui vivent et travaillent en milieu d'établissements correctionnels, mais aussi pour appuyer les organisations qui facilitent la transition et la, ré la réhabilitation des, des personnes qui vivent ou qui vivent en contexte correctionnel, donc des investissements importants dans le contexte de la COVID-19. Deuxièmement, comme on a entendu, des bons résultats, de bonnes nouvelles pour l'approvisionnement à la fois intérieur et international, toujours en collaboration et en appui aux provinces et aux territoires. Troisièmement, comme le Premier ministre le disait ce matin, nous avons des discussions importantes avec opposition parties sur continuing to support uh, Canadian families and Canadian workers in a context in which the economic situation still requires both income and job support. So we are having fruitful and collaborative discussions with opposition parties on matters of uh, providing the important assistance that we announced last week when it comes to supporting people living with disabilities, but also in terms of uh, making uh, the CERB in particular even more complementary to the uh, important uh, emergency wage subsidies, making sure that the CERB continues its vigor and its rigor, vigor in assisting the, uh, the millions of Canadians in, in difficulties, but who are 
increasingly seeking to return to work in a safe environment and as well as ensuring that all Canadians understand that this is made in a rigorous manner uh, designed to protect the integrity of Canadian taxpayers. So that would be my brief summary, Christian. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jean-Yves. And now we're ready to answer your questions. Carl, s'il vous plaît. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. As usual, we'll start with three questions on the phone before turning to the room. So one question, one follow-up. Operator, over to you. Star one on your telephone keypad. Si vous avez une question, faites étoile un sur votre clavier. If you have a question, clavier. press star one. The first on question the is from Justin Ling from Freelance. Please go ahead. Your line is now open. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, this is for Minister Blair. Um, you know, since the start of the pandemic and obviously long before that, there have been calls to start releasing nonviolent and low risk inmates. Uh, this whole pandemic, um, you know, everyone from Human Rights Commission to the Correctional Investigator to Indigenous groups to um, many, many other organizations have, have said that that is a step that needs to happen. Obviously, those calls are also part of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Inquiry. Yet, even today, it doesn't seem like that is part of a priority for you. What is holding you back from looking at the inmates who are currently in federal custody and ordering the release of those who don't pose a risk to the public? Well, thank you very much, Justin, for, for what I think is a very important question. And, and first of all, I would like I would I begin by answering that our first priority in all decisions with respect to, to to the release of federal inmates into the community is our first priority is always public safety. And and I know the public the, we work very closely with the Canada uh, Correction Services um, as well as 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 the Pro Board of Canada to ensure that that what people who were eligible release were were um, expeditiously. Uh, uh, dealt with because we recognize that uh, crowding in our prisons and, and, and the, the, the potential risk of uh, in the prisons through the COVID-19 uh, um, epidemic w was significant. I can advise you that the federal custody population since March the 1st has now declined by a total of 713 inmates. And so that's a net reduction of, of the inmate population of 713. I, I will tell you that's quite significant and unprecedented. Um, it's, it's a direct result of two things. Excellent work by Correction Services Canada and the Parole Board of Canada in expediting and dealing appropriately and quickly with people who were eligible for release so that they could be safely reintegrated back into the, into the, the community. And it's also important to acknowledge that as a result of work that's being done in our provincial institution, our provincial courts, we've seen fewer people coming into the federal system as well. But we also recognize, Justin, that there are a number of people for whom it is not safe to release back into the community. And that's why the work that Correction Services Canada has done with, in partnership with the Public Health Agency of Canada and local pub public health authorities to ensure a safe environment for those um, in inmate population and the people working in that prison had a safe and healthy environment to work in. And so those workplace health and safety audits, the, the infection control and infection prevention audits, the work of ensuring that everyone had access to appropriate personal protection equipment, the work of our, our medical and health staffs and, and, and working with the local health authorities, um, and the testing and tracing that has taken place have all been very important and very effective in maintaining a safe environment for those people in our federal institutions that were not eligible for early release. Mr. Ling, follow up. Yeah, so just quickly, I mean, you said that those numbers are unprecedented. Of course, you know, around 600 inmates are, are released due to statutory release every month anyway. So, you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure uh, whether or not there's there's additional uh, releases going on above and beyond that number that you want to fill us in on. Um, but beyond that, obviously, there's there's a broader conversation happening right now about um, systemic racism against black and indigenous people um, in the justice system and policing. Do you think systemic racism has a, is a factor in the fact that Indigenous and Black Canadians are wildly overrepresented in federal uh, inmate uh, in federal prisons? Yeah, Justin, I, I would I would acknowledge that within all of societal systems, within within the justice system, but also our mental health system, health other health systems, the education system, employment systems, there are disparate outcomes. And which, which reflect, I believe, a social injustice that does exist in our society. And that's one of the reasons we as a government have been working so hard to address those disparities and to create a f greater fairness. But if I may speak specifically to, to the criminal justice system. 
you also be very, very clear that discrimination on the basis of race or any other form of bias is not only abhorrent and unacceptable, it's un unlawful. It's contrary to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. It's contrary to the Canadian Human Rights Act. Um, it, it is something that cannot be tolerated within policing or corrections or any aspect of the justice system. It's one of the reasons that we have, we have put in bias-free policing policy for the RCMP and, and, and through their training and hiring, um, I, I think it, it needs to be very clear that, that it is unacceptable and that we will not just simply denounce it, but we'll work hard to eliminate it within all of the disparate and socially unjust systems that exist in Canadian society. Merci, Monsieur le Ministre. Opératrice, prochaine question, s'il vous plaît. Thank you. Next question, operator. Thank you. Merci. La prochaine question est de Lina Dib de la Presse canadienne. La parole est à vous. La presse canadienne. Over Merci. To you. Uh, Minister Blair, I'm, I'm going to continue along the lines of what Justin was asking you about. So I don't know as much as he does uh, from this file. So could you explain to me that 713 uh, number that you gave, how many of those were actually released because of the pandemic to avoid them catching COVID-19 in prison? Let me thank you for very much for the opportunity to clarify. When I said that the, the prison population has declined by 713 inmates, I mean in the net. And, and as Justin indicated, and he's correct, approximately 600 people come into the system each month, and a commensurate, a, a very similar number, about the same go out. And so on average, we have about 14,000 people at any given time within the correction system um, in, in Canada, with, with, within our federal institutions. As a result of work done during this pandemic, we have seen that number of 14,000 reduced in the net by 713, which means more than that 713 more people have been released than it then entered the system. Okay, and and so I do understand that though that number is people that were released because of the pandemic. No, ma'am. Let, let me be very clear. No. It, it, because I, 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 I just I want to be make sure that I'm very clear with you. Um, the Parole Board of Canada and Correction Services Canada um, makes decisions about the release of, of people into the community each and every day um, from our federal institutions. Um, that is always based on, on very clear legal criteria and a determination of, of the health concerns or safety concerns of the communities in which the, the people were released and also to ensure that, that people are released in such circumstances that they are, are likely to be successful in their reintegration and, and not to reoffend. And so that's, and that's one of the reasons I mentioned earlier the support that we're providing to the national voluntary organizations who do some great work in helping helping people reintegrate in safely and, and successfully back into society. And so that work takes place on an ongoing basis. We also recognize the importance of that work, and so the Pro Board of Canada, for example, has, has had extra staff on. They've been working weekends to deal with those individuals who are eligible for release and who perhaps for a number of reasons may be at greater risk during this pandemic. And the, the, so the, their work has proceeded according to all of the rules. We're not releasing people for whom it is unsafe to release, but they have been, have been working expeditiously to ensure that for those who are eligible that that happened in a quick and efficient way. And we've also, and, and so a number of measures I'll share with you, for example, from, from an, an individual entering into an institution uh, from a community where the, the, the virus was present, those, those individuals are tested before they enter into the, 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 the institution. And for prisoners who are being released back into community, they're also tested to make sure that their reintegration in society can be done safely. And we work very closely with the local public health authorities to, to, to protect the health and safety of the inmates, the workers, and the communities in which these offenders are released. Uh, Est-ce que je peux avoir ma deuxième question à, à M. Duclos? May I ask Lina. my second question uh, to Mr. Duclos? Uh, Dites-moi, M. Trudeau tout à l'heure parlait de, Earlier, de marche de naturelle Trudeau des choses, que de façon naturelle, on va natural, passer de la PCU à la subvention salariale. J'aimerais savoir, est-ce que vous êtes en train uh, de, de concocter une quelconque serve? mesure, une quelconque façon de convaincre les gens de passer à la subvention salariale, parce que jusqu'à maintenant, ça n'a pas, pas été le so far, succès que vous espériez. Alors, est-ce que vous attendez juste à ce que ça se passe tout seul? Ou est-ce que vous êtes en train de faire quelque chose pour pousser les entreprises vers la 
Ben, la ré... Merci pour la question. La réponse, je dirais, c'est qu'il faut utiliser des termes économiques, c'est à la fois la diversité et l'efficacité. Parce qu'il faut reconnaître, et M. Trudeau le, le fait encore ce matin, il faut reconnaître qu'il y a une très grande diversité de circonstances au Québec et au Canada. Il y a des travailleurs qui aimeraient bien se trouver un emploi, mais qui ne peuvent pas en trouver un. Il y a des travailleurs qui vont bientôt en trouver un et qui aimeraient avoir les conditions sanitaires et incitatives pour le faire. Donc, il faut, prendre, prendre, faut, faut reconnaître à la fois la diversité des contextes et le retour vers une croissance économique plus, plus soutenable et plus importante à, à long terme. Et ça, ça, prend, ça nécessite des mécanismes efficaces de, de, de politique publique. Et c'est pour ça que même si, au début, la prestation canadienne d'urgence était totalement bien indiquée dans le contexte d'urgence du début de la crise, mais on s'aperçoit que maintenant, elle est de moins en moins utile et de moins en moins adaptée au contexte de reprise économique. Et c'est pour ça que, à nouveau, M. Trudeau a annoncé ce matin qu'on travaille et qu'on va continuer à le faire au cours des prochaines semaines et des prochains mois pour continuer à évoluer enfin, en fonction de notre évaluation de la situation. Uh, based on our assessment of the situation. Merci, Monsieur le ministre opérateur. Prochaine Thank question, s'il vous plaît. Thank you, Ms. Minister. Next question, Merci. please. Thank you. The next question is from Stephanie Levitt from the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Your line is now open. Good afternoon. My, my questions are both for Minister Blair. Um, first off, Minister, I wonder if you could talk about whether or not you see any value in police wearing body cameras and what the pros and cons of that might be. Yeah, thank you, Stephanie. Um, I, I, in, in my experience, I, I think um, transparency and accountability are very important to maintaining trust between the police and the communities that they serve. Um, I also know from some experience that video evidence can be the best possible evidence to, to give um, us all of, and, and the public a better understanding of exactly what transpired. Um, I've been involved in a number of pilots in which body cams have been used, and, and I think it's, it's important to recognize that there are a number of significant considerations, and not all of which are technical. Certainly, making sure that the, the, the cameras are of, of good quality and of adequate battery life, and uploading the, 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 the data on in, into, a, into a, a secure environment is all important, but there are also serious considerations, policy considerations, with respect to the privacy uh, concerns of Canadians, and so all of that work is important. But I believe that the, the presence of video evidence, as, as can be made available um, under the right circumstances following the appropriate policies respectful of Canadians' privacy interests, um, that that video evidence can provide the best possible evidence to help inform um, exactly what transpired. It is also an important uh, tool of accountability uh, because, you know, police ex uh, possess extraordinary authorities in our society and, and, and they must be held to account. Uh, for their conduct, and, and, body, and the body camera can provide the evidence to enable that to take place effectively. Stephanie, follow-up? Yeah, thank you. Um, a, a few minutes ago, you talked about the bias-free policing policy within the RCMP, but in the last couple of days, we've, just seen, we've seen recent recent instances of what appear to be the RCMP mishandling calls involving Indigenous people. I mean, your colleague Mark Miller used the words he's outraged and pissed off about what he's seen. So. What are you going to do about it? Yeah, I, I, I think it's a very important question. And I have to tell you, the relationship and, and the, the, the service that in, the policing services in Indigenous communities, um, clearly that, that there is work to be done. And, and, and frankly, I, I am quite, uh, I, I share Minister Miller's concern that individuals who engage in, in, in misconduct and don't do their jobs properly need to be held to account. Um, and at the same time, I do recognize the importance of those policing services in those communities. And it's one of the reasons we'll be working very closely with Indigenous communities to develop a new legislative framework for the delivery of policing services um, to make those police services more accountable um, and, and, and more under the control of in Indigenous communities. Um, it's an important dialogue that's taking place, but we're absolutely committed to, to providing every part of this country with uh, professional and culturally competent policing, but also policing that, that is worthy and trust, entrusted by a community to provide those services in, in, in an appropriate way, in a bias-free way, in a professional way. And so um, I, 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 I do not in any, in any time um, accept the, 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 the 
the mis any any potential misconduct of police officers. I think that their accountability is important, but it's important also that there be systems of oversight and accountability to ensure that that's done properly. Merci, Monsieur le Ministre. On va maintenant prendre les questions dans la salle. On commence par Mackenzie. Uh, hi, Mr. Uh, Dr. Tam, uh, Mackenzie Gray with CTV News. Uh, yesterday, the WHO said that asymptomatic transmission of COVID-19 was very rare, uh, and about an hour ago, they have come out and walked that back. Uh, I would like your opinion on what uh, and how big an role that asymptomatic transmission plays. Um, with the virus right now, and Ms. Freeland, in the same vein, uh, the WHO has made uh, what would be quite a large error in coming out and saying that it was very rare and then having to walk it back in the same day. And there have been a number of questions about the organization and how it's been run, specifically on health information that comes from the WHO. Should Canadians trust the information that they are putting out? So uh, we learn about this new virus every day, but it is clear that there are asymptomatic cases, first of all. Um, and depending on the studies that uh, and which populations have been studied, uh, asymptomatic uh, people um, can represent a significant proportion of cases. Of course, some of them are actually mildly symptomatic or what we call pre-symptomatic as well, but there's definitely asymptomatic cases. Studies on transmission of the virus from asymptomatic cases are not very easy to do, do um, but um, there are studies um, that have shown that um, a, 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 transmission of the virus from asymptomatic people can occur. Now, I think what is uh, still undergoing evolution in terms of the information is to what extent that does occur. Um, so that there are definitely studies that shows it does. But the other thing that we know is asymptomatic cases appear to have the same amount of virus in the back of the nose as people who uh, are symptomatic. And this together with some of the information to date on uh, the transmission potential uh, is, is why we have um, evolved our policy to take into account that this this uh, possibility, including, uh, for example, the wearing of masks when you can't maintain the physical distance. So uh, that is our knowledge uh, to date. Uh, and let me just say, Mackenzie, I think Canadians should keep on doing what they've been doing, which is to listen to and to trust first and foremost the medical advice of Canada's medical experts, of the public health officers in Canada. Uh, and the more local, the better. Uh, Canadian public health officers across the country have been working really, really hard. Uh, we have a vast and diverse country, and conditions are very, very different across our country. Local public health officers are really, really focused on what is going on in their province, in their town, in their city, in their region. And I think they are giving Canadians excellent advice. And of course, one of the great things about the Canadian medical community is how well connected it is with peers and partners around the world and how carefully Canada's medical experts plug into that information and share it with us in ways particularly appropriate to and informed by the situation here on the ground at home. Um, my second question is for Mr. Blair. Uh, there have been a number of high-profile incidents recently between the police uh, and Canadians who are racialized. In Ottawa, there was a bylaw officer who punched someone in the face for a social distancing ticket. A black woman falls off her balcony in Toronto. The RCMP in Nunavut hit an indigenous man with his car. We could go on. Why do you think that these uh, issues that police have, usually involving substantial amount of force or potentially someone dying, almost always involves someone who is a racialized Canadian. And further to that, one of the ways that the protesters across the country have been discussing ways to deal with that is to what they call defund the police, where they take a portion of the police budget and put that towards communities who are marginalized to help them with social services. Do you think that is an idea that the federal government should implement? Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. And, and these are important questions and important discussions that are taking place right across Canada. Um, first of all, let me be really clear. I will never defend the indefensible. And, and where someone um, appears to, to, to exceed their authority or use excessive force 
or act in a discriminatory way, that that needs to be, that individual needs to be held to account. And there are processes and, and oversight mechanisms to ensure that that happens. And those things are important, and we continue to support them. Um, and at the same time, um, I, I also recognize, you know, the concerns with that when, when people say that we need to do better in communities, when we need to address issues of mental illness and addiction, when we need to ad address the, you know, the uh, history of, 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 of abuse and mistreatment and the generational trauma that comes from that, that we, that we need to address inadequate housing um, in our communities, that I, I agree completely. And, and I think those are things that, as a, as a government, as a country, we need to look at all of the, the conditions that give rise to social injustice in every place in our country and do a better job. And we're absolutely committed to doing that. Um, I will also say, because I've been involved in, in, in policing personally for a long period of time, that it, it's not a zero-sum sum discussion, that, that every, every part of the country also deserves professional and culturally competent, accountable policing services. But every part of the country also needs to ensure that we address those social conditions that give rise to injustice, get, that give rise to disparate outcomes that cause people to suffer. And, and so the work of supporting Canadians in every part of our country, and particularly racialized Canadians, Indigenous Canadians and, and, and racialized Canadians in, in all parts of this country, we need to do a better job of providing them support and helping their, their kids be successful, their communities be safer, and we have to ensure that the police that are there to serve and protect them are, are, are culturally competent, capable, professional, and accountable in how they perform those duties. Thank you, Minister. Olivia? Good afternoon, Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News. Minister Blair, I have two questions for you. The first one has to do, again, with body cameras. I'm wondering if you can be very specific about who is going to pay for these body cameras, where is this money going to come from, how much are we talking about, how much money, and do you have a timeline as well for when we can see these roll out? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it, I think it's important to recognize that p responsibility in police jurisdictions are, are different right across the country. Um, policing generally is, is in, and the serve, delivery of policing services is, is under the, the responsibility of the provi provinces. Um, and most police officers, more than 65% of police officers in this country, actually are municipal police officers working for police services boards and, and municipalities across the country. And, and, and so, the police that we are responsible for are those RCMP officers working particularly in First Nations, Indigenous and Territorial communities. And so we are, we are absolutely committed to moving forward on that, as the Prime Minister has indicated. I've had discussions with the Commissioner. But the Prime Minister has also indicated, and I'll be following up on this, in discussions with the provinces and territories, but also with municipalities ac across the country to develop strong policy frameworks to ensure that, that this technology and other technologies are always respectful of Canadians' privacy rights, but do the job of creating greater accountability. And so um, I've had some discussion with the Commissioner of the RCMP. They piloted body cams in a number of different environments. We're working on the policy framework that would support their use, and we'll move forward as quickly with that as, as, as we're able. Um, I don't have a specific time frame, but we are absolutely committed to creating a, a better and safer, a more accountable environment in, in the communities that we serve, and at the same time, we'll work closely with the provinces and territories and municipalities across the country to enable them to do the things that, that can ensure that they're providing appropriate policing services for the people they're, they're responsible for. Minister Blair, were you informed of the arrest of Liberal MP Marwan Tabera when it happened back in April, or did you find out through media reports last Friday? I found out through your media reports. I had no knowledge of it prior to that. Does that mark a breakdown in communication? <laughs> Well, well, again, I think there is a responsibility on on every member of this house to bring such information forward. The, 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 that information about the the, the, the charges being laid um, were not brought to our attention un, until the member did so. Um, I think every member has that responsibility to report uh, to this house and 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 to their leader. Um, the circumstances that they find themselves in. Um, I only became aware of that when the media reported it. Merci, Monsieur le Ministre. We're going to take one last question you, on the Minister. phone. Operator. Thank you. Merci. La prochaine question est de Marie Vastel de Le Devoir. Le Devoir. You have the floor. 
Oui, bonjour, M. Duclos. J'aimerais revenir sur euh, l'annonce d'aujourd'hui ou en tout cas l'annonce d'un projet de loi à, à venir pour pénaliser les fraudeurs de la PCU. J'aimerais savoir, euh, vous avez dit que vous n'allez pas pénaliser les, les erreurs de bonne foi, que, que c'est vraiment pour s'attaquer aux fraudeurs délibérés, si je peux dire. Mais pouvez-vous nous, nous expliquer un peu comment vous allez différencier euh, les cas de fraude intentionnelle, que, quels vont être les mécanismes ou les méthodes de vérification, qu'est-ce que vous allez Merci pour la question. Mais la première chose que je devrais dire, c'est que la très grande majorité des Canadiens, comme on le sait, sont des gens honnêtes. Il arrive malheureusement, dans des circonstances d'urgence comme on a vécu dans les dernières semaines, que ces personnes honnêtes fassent des erreurs de bonne foi. Et le contexte du mois d'avril en particulier est un contexte très difficile pour des millions de Canadiens qui craignaient de ne pas recevoir d'aide d'urgence. Alors, il y avait un certain, une certaine confusion qui était tout à fait naturelle entre la, la, la prestation canadienne d'urgence et les prestations beaucoup mieux connues d'assurance emploi. Donc, des dizaines de milliers de Canadiens ont fait une double demande, mais ce sont un exemple d'erreurs de bonne foi. Il y a aussi des erreurs de bonne foi qui ont été commises par la suite, et parfois des erreurs qui n'étaient pas des erreurs au début, mais qui se sont avérées des erreurs quand des gens ont appris l'information ou bien sur le programme ou bien sur leur propre circonstance après qu'ils aient fait une demande de prestation. Donc, la grande majorité des gens sont honnêtes. La proportion de gens qui ont fait des erreurs de bonne foi est, est modeste, mais ça reste quand même une proportion importante euh, que, qui est d'ailleurs déjà en train d'être traitée. Mais, comme on a vu dans les médias au cours des derniers jours, des dernières semaines, il y a, et c'est pas surprenant non plus, euh, des fraudeurs, des gens qui qui profitent de, de circonstances exceptionnelles, mais qui le font aussi dans des contextes non exceptionnels pour tirer avantage du système. Et là, heureusement, euh, nous avons à la fois les, les agents de Service Canada et les agents de l'Agence de revenus du Canada qui savent très bien comment retracer la fraude et la corriger. Et même si c'était annoncé dès le départ que ça allait être fait, les discussions que nous avons présentement avec les partis d'opposition vont permettre plus particulièrement aux agents de l'Agence de revenus du Canada d'identifier, mais certainement de corriger cette fraude avec des signaux très clair maintenant, encore plus clair qu'avant, euh, des signaux que si les choses ont été faites de manière frauduleuse, donc de mauvaise foi, en utilisant des mécanismes bien établis euh, par les deux agences, mais cette fraude pourra être sujette à des pénalités importantes. Merci, mais justement, ma question, c'était quels sont ces mécanismes bien établis? Euh, donc, peut-être ensuite, si vous avez la réponse, vous pourriez me la donner. Est-ce qu'on parle d'exclure d'après Dieu les gens qui avaient fait une double demande à faire? automatically excluded people who made two applications. I'd like to have explanations if you have Blair, if I may, and maybe you have a more informational answer to provide. Um, the Army deployment in Quebec and Ontario uh, long-term residences is, uh, is supposed to end on Friday, June 12th. Can you give us an update on whether they will stay longer in one of both of those provinces and until what date? J'aimerais rapidement, Marie, euh, vous... from, uh, en fait, j'aimerais bien vous donner Mr. tous les détails de ces mécanismes, all, like mais ils sont très élaborés. Vous allez les retrouver sur les sites de l'Agence de revenus du Canada et euh, le site though, de Service Canada. Évidemment, ils tiennent web, compte à la fois website, rather, uh, de la diversité, mais aussi de la complexité des cas. Il n'y a pas un mécanisme qui s'applique à tous les cas. And, and with respect to, to, to the request for assistance from Quebec, uh, back in, in early April, when re Quebec contacted us and requested our assistance, we responded rapidly and positively, and, and we uh, used the Canadian Armed Forces to deploy. And, and over a 1,000 uh, Canadian Armed Forces members have deployed into those long-term care facilities in Quebec. And, and I take the opportunity to acknowledge, I think they've done an extraordinary job in, in, in creating a safer environment and helping protect the health and safety of Canadians. We continue to work very closely with the province of Quebec, and, and you know, the problem has, has not 
uh, abated, and there is, are still significant concerns in the long-term care facility, and so we're bringing additional resources to the issue, and, and we're, we've been working very closely with Canadian Red Cross, and, and we have developed a working plan, and we funded the Canadian Red Cross to provide additional resources and additional services in the long-term care facilities in Quebec. And so we are, are, are working towards, with the province of Quebec, um, a, a, a combination of uh, Canadian Red Cross uh, volunteers and workers, and as well as Canadian Armed Forces workers, to c continue to provide the support that Quebec has asked for and requires. And, and it's very much a collaborative effort um, as we're working between ourselves and the province of Quebec to ensure that they receive the help that they need. The protection and safety of Canadians in those long-term care facilities is our priority, and we'll continue to work hard with, with Quebec um, and, and work in partnership, not only with the Canadian Armed Forces, but with the Canadian Red Cross um, and and, 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 and ultimately, we want to maintain a, a sustainable um, response to the request for assistance received from Quebec. Thank you, Minister. Ceci met fin à la conférence de presse pour aujourd'hui. Merci. Thank you, everyone. That ends the press conference for today. Thank you, everyone.